what I'm going to um, do is invite each of you in turn to say a few things about um, what you have found or what do you think really works well um, or has been successful in terms of um, getting organisations to think and act digitally and that actually have some impactful social change. So just a few nuggets about that. Um, and then at the same time, um, conversely, what, what are one or two things in your experience or that you noticed that are stumbling blocks um, or challenges or things that get in the way of that? Okay. So who'd like to begin? And we'll just maybe go to the left of whoever begins. Okay. So over to you. Okay. I, don't, I don't mind going first. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, I, would, I would say really... It's about starting with the user and making it really user-centric. I know we all kind of say that kind of stuff in these sort of um, environments, but I think over the number of years at AGK um, projects I've been involved with, I think um, we've moved within the organisation from thinking about, I want to put this form here or I want to build a hub, to changing the conversation to more about it being more about what the user wants. Um, and, you know, trying to, trying to get that into everyone's psyche that that's, that's the most important thing. It's about the user. Mm -hmm. It's not about... Uh, what system can we have or what te technology can we have, but it's about what does the user want and what does the user need, and starting that from the very start of, of the project work that we do and the delivery that we do. Okay. And a stumbling block? Uh, getting people to think that way. <laughs> um, you know, and some of that is a way, way of working thing. If people aren't used to working that way and people are used to working in more of a, you know, writing lots of documentation and, um, you know, thinking about, they already think what solution they need. Um, so I think... That's just in terms of getting going with some stuff, that can be a challenge. But I think the way we've sometimes got around that is you know, by having, having really good workshops where you just get people to, uh, to engage in thinking about users um, and maybe quickly you know, mock something up or draw something or, or something and make it, you know, just getting people into that psyche. Okay. So, Audrey, um, what are the things that um, you've noticed that work well um, and conversely that get in the way? I think... Um, well, it's not in addition to. Okay. Um, finding a way of communicating uh, your users' needs and the evidence that you have in a way that is really compelling so that the people who are making decisions in your organisation or the people who are resisting change can actually empathise a lot more. I think that's really, really powerful because there are lots of people that go out and do research and collect user needs, and then it gets put in a slide deck or in a report or in an Excel spreadsheet, and then doesn't ever really get touched. And actually that research has to kind of be internalized by people, and it needs to be over-communicated way beyond what you think is necessary for it to actually land in the organization. Okay, well, should we just let all these lovely people arrive? Um, and. Uh, to say that we've been asking our panel um, what really works well in terms of um, getting digital impact and getting organisations to think differently about digital. Um, and Paul was um, essentially talking about the user experience. Um, so, and you're all very welcome. Um, okay, so Audrey, and in addition to... Um, have you got any more thoughts about what works well and what gets in the way of that? Sure. Um, I suppose kind of two sides of the same coin if an organization can get somebody in at a senior level who really gets digital and can understand its potential to transform the organization and really deliver impact in different ways rather than just digitizing things that are currently paper it can make a massive difference if you don't have somebody at the top if you don't have a trustee who gets digital everything is that much harder so landing the right person who can actually start challenging senior views is really important so, Duncan, what are your thoughts about what, what works well and uh, what gets in the way? So, um, yeah, I would reiterate being user-led as, as a key thing that we would want to focus on. Um, I think one thing we see a lot, which we... Um, which we... we well, it's, it's two sides of, it, of the same coin, but um, when people use existing tools, that can work really well. We see a lot of organisations thinking they need to build a new app themselves and they start a process to build a new digital tool which they think is, um, which meets the bespoken specific needs of the user's audience or, or whoever they're trying to engage. And it's normally the case that there are uh, a, an off-the-shelf solution or a combination of off-the-shelf solutions that can do 80, 90% of that job um, without you having to go through 
the pain, the time, the money uh, of developing your own product. And I think often we see organisations underestimate what that takes, um, both from a service design perspective from the, you know, the, how you actually design something that's fit for purpose, but then just the ongoing need to support a digital product, iterate it, keep it up to date. Um, the, the resources and, uh, and money associated with that is, are significant. And organisations typically don't have tech teams or are build, trying to build tech teams that have that capability. Um, and often someone else has already built that product. So I think the best, sometimes the best way into this is by saying, OK, how can I get there really quickly with something that I can pull off the shelf and adapt or just use, rather than building something new myself? Um, and just, I guess, in terms of big... So things that we see that get in the way, I think the biggest thing for me is when I see organisations... I completely agree getting someone, getting leadership to understand tech or digital is really important. Having advocates uh, and understanding at the top is important. What, what we see, which I don't think works very well, but is the easiest way to set digital transformation up, is when it's set up on the side of the organisation. So you often get, right, new head of digital transformation appointed, builds team, develops products, services, thinks digital. And digital happens over here, and the rest of the organisation just carries on doing what it's doing. And it's a bit like when, um, when uh, online retail started, you know, 15 years ago. The, the, all, all, all of these organisations, like you know, New Look or whatever, set up their, their online businesses on the side like another store. And the, the core business just saw them as this threat, this, this competition that was taking their customers and cannibalising their, their world. And ultimately, as a customer of New Look or whoever, you don't care, you know, all you want is your product delivered to you in the most accessible, easy sort of format and, and channel that, that, that fits what, what your needs are. But, but you end up with an organisation that sort of is competing over the customer and, and therefore providing a poor customer experience. I see our sector doing the same thing, which is you know, just, just setting digital up in competition to the existing services in a way which means you can't deliver an integrated service proposition, which is detrimental to the value you can deliver whoever the users of your, of your services are. Okay. So anything more that either of you would like to add before we ask our audience to say what they think? Yeah, I, sure. Um, on the immunity response that you get in organisations when you insert a digital team, um, uh, we had that in Bernardo's, <coughs> um, and it, uh, from the start, was a, um, a deliberate decision uh, by the digital director to focus on integrating with the rest of the organisation. Mm. So you take a pre-existing, a very, very long established organisation with all of the traditional functions, you can't just drop new skills, new capabilities, new roles into that and not have people feeling threatened. Um, and so working with social research and policy and HR and retail and business development and all of the other functions, it's taken a really long time to build up the trust necessary and to figure out where kind of the boundaries and the connections between all of the different functions are. Um, so it's really something that you need to be in for the long haul. And although you'll have people, including people like me, coming in and saying you need to try and get quick wins really, really early on, that's a win that you can't get quickly. Mm. It will take time. Okay. Paul? Yeah, I'm just picking, on, picking up on that. We've, over the time I've been uh, at EGK, we've tried different things um, to embed and spread digital around the organisation. Some things, some things have worked, some things have, have, haven't worked. We've tried things like Digital Champions, which was quite an interesting idea of getting a sort of tribe of people who were ones that wanted to adopt it and embrace it and work that way. Um, and we had some success with that. We had some things that didn't work with that. Um, so I think it's also being kind of honest with yourself when that stuff is, you've got, in the same way that you're building a product, you're trying different things. Actually, with, with the way you're working with people, you try different things. And, and if it isn't working, going, all right, it's not working, we've got to try something else. So I think, you know, you've got to keep plugging away at that stuff. But yeah, creating that sort of, yeah, we sort of use the word digital tribe, you know, people who want to work with us on stuff as well is, is, is a really, um, I suppose it's an easier win in a way, but actually if you start with people who are wanting to work digitally, then that really helps. Yeah, okay. So um, we'll have more from our panel shortly, but what I thought would be quite um, useful and interesting is if you um, have a conversation with your, somebody who's sitting next to you, and if there isn't anybody sitting next to you, somebody behind you, uh, maybe in pairs, but maybe or, or a three. Um, thinking about, uh, well, also, also what you've just heard, but what questions might you have for the panel? Um, 
and what information um, that you might like to share about what has worked in your experience and what and also what the stumbling blocks are and what um, you know you might have done to overcome them and you or you may not know the answer to that, that might be the question okay so um, for about five minutes if you could um, have a conversation with your somebody next to you about um, how you actually embed all of this and what are the stumbling blocks and how you might overcome it okay so off you go and I will then stand up in five minutes <laughs> I'm doing this because I learned this a long time ago. I was in a Quaker center, and you know, they, they're very peaceful and quiet. And instead of shouting at people, um, when we were at a very big conference, they said, this is what we do when we want people to be quiet. And it actually works. <laughs> anyway, wonderful. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed um, chewing the fat with your neighbor. Um, as you can see, there are some questions coming up on the Slido already, which is lovely. Before we take any of those, though, is there anyone here who's got a question or something they'd like to share um, with the room and with the panel? So who'd like to kick us off? Yes, lovely. Can you stand up and say your name out loud so that we can hear you um, and use a bit of a... Oh, we've got a microphone. Excellent. Lovely. I'm from um, Jessie. I'm from Solace Women's Aid. We're a, the largest London provider of domestic violence and sexual violence services. We have about 150 staff members and 90 volunteers who are kind of acting as staff members. And um, the problem we have is I totally get the top-down kind of buy-in, and I think that's important. And I'm not sure we've got that in the moment, but there are directors who are leading on this and are keen to make this happen. So it's happening in some ways, but we've also got kind of, I don't want to say a fear by a lot of our long-term workers, because we've been around for a while, that they just don't have the capacity to take on another thing. And even if ultimately they know it will make their job easier, the six months of learning or whatever it is around getting to that point is so, is too much. And they feel so overwhelmed by the amount of work they're having to do just <coughs> by nature of the charity sector. <laughs> um, they, we can't organizational buy-in okay so what's your question so my question is do you have any helpful hints about okay. how we could make it happen and make people feel enthusiastic about it because ultimately it will make their job easier lovely but yeah excellent so how can we help reduce the fear and en enable people who are reluctant to um, enjoy um, becoming more digital okay um, there's also a question up there, is what didn't work with having digital champions? So that's your top-down kind of thing. So we might be able to think about those two together. Who'd like to kick off with... Yes, Could I, Audrey? Yeah, uh, kick off with the first uh, part of your question. Um, uh, what's worked with us is um, prototyping and trialling with small group. So they're part of designing the version of, what, or, of whatever the solution is. The part of, a couple of them are part of actually creating it. And so they're, they're there from the start. And uh, you can kind of prove the concept with them. And um, you can actually use the kind of small scale, the development of the ultimate solution, integrate with their current workflows, all of that. You can use that as a case study for the others. And you can use them as an advocate for the others. So you don't start with the people that are most scared. Start with the people who are excited about it and go from there. Lovely. Anything either of you would like to add? Duncan? Yeah, I, I would just reiterate that by saying, I think if you can root it in what their pain points are around their job. So they're overworked, there's lots of whatever the administrative burden or else is and, and, and really connect how the, whatever the digital tools are you're gonna introduce, how, how they can connect to solving some of those pain points. The, the more direct that can be and the more like, tangible that can be. And I think living that is the best way to do it. But then from that, how that can be very, very clearly sold as a as a something that that is worth going through that transition for because because it will solve this big thing problem that you have or challenge that you have lovely maybe you'd like to address the digital champion so what worked why, why didn't it work yeah i think it was um getting people's time commitment so i think quite often you start off and the, you have a first session and some follow-up ones and everyone's very enthusiastic and then people sort of have got it's a horrible thing. So their day job, they might see that. So I've got this other stuff they've got to do. So I think properly getting buy-in from their line managers or departments that they're doing that, and they can then do something tangibly with it. So that that was a bit of a challenge. Um, I think we also found a little bit. Some of it is in the, just the ways of working. 
Um, because I think certainly um, the digital way of working can be very different from how other people, certainly in our, in our charity, work in terms of methodology. So mm. just going back with this, well, we're going to do it completely different to how we do it is, is quite a challenge. Okay. Um, so I think what we've tried to then do is to do other sort of sessions around uh, and training around um, how to run a how to run a workshop to do maybe an end-to-end -end service uh, flow, something like that. Because what we're not, some of this isn't isn't reinventing the wheel. It's kind of it, we're calling it other things to what people might calling it, but we're doing it in a different way. We might be doing it with lots of post-it notes instead of, you know, um, doing it in a long document or something like that. Okay, lovely. Um, any another question from somebody? Or, or, or you, yes. So there's the, the lady there, and then you with the glasses in the front. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Emma, I'm from a, um, a small charity in Liverpool. Um, I suppose what I want to know is how do we get the government to drive digital agenda within charities? So as a, as a charity we get our support locally from the local CVS, but I'm not hearing anything on the digital agenda from them. Um, I've had to go out and find different support organisations and so I'm looking for digital, digital support from other people and I just think it probably needs to be coordinated better um, so that smaller organisations can actually get the same sort of support as larger organisations that could possibly afford it more. Okay, so where can smaller organisations get uh, digital support? I just think it needs to be a bit more strategic, it feels quite... Okay, a more strategic. Moment, so let's yeah. hold that one, and then we'll ask this, quest this question from the front here. What's our panel's thinking about these things? Yes, this lady here with the glasses. Just going yeah. Hi, um, my name's Martha. I work for a, an arts charity, which is based around literature, and we're 200 years old, and we're governed by writers. So this kind of ties into one of the Slido questions as well because well, our t office team is very young and there's only four of us um, and we're all for digital change, um, but getting the trustees on board with that is difficult. We can co-opt other people on. Um, what you were saying earlier about getting senior level people who understand digital. So part of my question is, where do we find a trustee? I know that it's covered in charity digital news sometimes, but. Obviously, they're very busy people if they're already working in the corporate world. Um, so it's yeah, just around kind of how to get someone in that can help with that. Lovely. OK, so we have two questions. One is, how do we get digital savvy trustees and get the, some um, support at that level? And how do small organisations get support and how can we be a bit more strategic about that? Um, so, who'd like to uh, address those to begin with? Maybe you, Paul. Have you, have you got any ideas? Um, I mean, I think in terms of the, the question around smaller charities, I guess um, I, th I think there was a sense in the question about couldn't sort of the government do more? And I mean, I, I'm not I'm not really probably best placed to, to to comment on that bit. I think I suppose my experience of working in the sector now for sort of six or seven years is. Um, sort of pleasantly surprised by the amount of collaboration between charities, you know, so we're not, whilst in a way charities compete for maybe resources or donations, actually, broadly speaking, we don't really in it versus a commercial world. So I think, um, I think that working together with, with different organisations and sh I mean, sharing what we do and how we do it, um, I know that's not particularly strategic, but I think um, that there is, there's an awful lot of resources out there and, and you know, organisations like charity comms and there's, there's, there's a lot of resources out there. Mm. Okay. Either of you like to um, address mm. that one and or the other one, which is actually, how, where do we get I mean, the only thing to add savvy trust to that? I think the government sort of outsourced it a little bit in that by, you know, through the big lottery fund, for instance, um, there is quite a lot of Con support for uh, they just launched their three new funding streams around uh, aimed at different sizes of charities. One very specifically aimed at smaller charities um, and helping them start their digital journey. Um, and yes, there's the typical application process to try and access that funding, but it feels like government is sort of saying, yes, we've we've sort of legislated for this money to be collected from the lottery, and we want it to be going used to like improve. Um, which we use within the, the third sector, but particularly through the big lottery, a real focus now around digital transformation and upskilling around digital. Um, I, I, I've seen, uh, there's, for instance, DCMS have just, re, just 
launched a new fund, £30 million, which I think Social Tech Trust are going to administer for them, investing in newer socially minded businesses and charities. Again, that doesn't necessarily help existing entities. So um, I think I agree that there needs to be a bit, there needs to be a bit more happening. They, I think they've, they've, they've seemed to have pushed it away from themselves a little bit and sort of outsourced it to these sort of quango, sort of quasi-governmental sort of entities which are, which are deploying capital in the space. Hmm. Okay. Anything, anything to add, Audrey? I suppose my answer to both would, would be mm. perhaps unhelpfully just networking. Mm. Uh, for, for the trustees, that if there are people you admire, ask them. Um, that's what um, Bernardo's would have done. Who do you recommend? People who, who are recommended, who would they recommend? You start to get a sense for who's good and who might be available, who might have time. Um, and just because you're a small team or an immature team or you don't have someone super senior doesn't mean that people won't give you your time, give you their time even. Um, and I suppose it's the same uh, with uh, finding what help is available for small charities. Um, there are lots of other people in exactly the same situation and trying to use the power of the network, even if there isn't somebody in central government who is trying to pull it all together for you. Um, yeah, your, your networking skills will really come to the fore uh, to help you with that problem. Hmm. Um, the, um, the, the, in my experience also, the, um, there are many younger, when I say younger, that's qualified, okay, so pro probably not young young, but younger than many um, trustees, um, who are very digitally savvy and actually very pro-social. Um, and in addition to networking, there, are, there is also, um, I don't know, some of you might have heard of New Role, N-U-R-O-L-E, which is a digital um, platform looking for non-exec directors and trustees. It's free. Um, and people who want to be found will also have their profiles in there, um, as well as um, any organization putting their opportunity in there to say we're actually looking especially for a trustee that would have these um, networks and these skills. So those kinds of things could also help um, if, you know, if you don't have a network where you can ask people. Could I just add something? Um, it's quite scary for um, a group of trustees who are all, let's say, older, mm -hmm. um, to think about maybe having a trustee who is under 40 mm -hmm. or under 30. Um, so the more uh, examples of, of organisations that have decided to do that, to bring in the skills that you might not get in the older cadre of trustees, mm -hmm. is really important. So look for who has decided to make that leap and then hold them up as examples to your trustees, to, to your executive, so that they can feel that other people have done it. So maybe it's not quite so scary. Maybe I won't be judged for being reckless. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, yes, the lady with the orange scarf. Um, my question is the last one. Oh, good. I was hoping somebody would read those out. <laughs> uh, the, my question, Pauline Roach from r and Organisation in Birmingham and Nelson Square Midlands. Um, my, so my question is, is anyone planning to make having the five essential digital skills a necessary skill set for all charity staff and trustees? And if I can add to that, you probably are familiar with Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old climate activist from, from Sweden, and she talks about needing to panic. I think we need to panic. We're not working hard enough. We're not doing enough, quickly enough, fast enough. Our beneficiaries are losing out because we're not changing. I've joined the, um, the board of the Small Charities Coalition. I'm a digital trustee. I don't want to be the digital trustee. Um, there is so much to be gained and there's no time to lose. People are being homeless, being, you know, committing suicide having drug and alcohol problems, you know, people are suffering, situations and causes are suffering because we are not using the full power of the internet and digital the way we should. And um, if you go home today and you're not panicking a little bit, then you've been at a different conference than me. <laughs> So, um, okay. yes. so that is something we're currently looking at at Age UK, yeah. So in terms of, um, so I guess it used to be the sort of thing in job descriptions where you might only put those things in technical roles or digital roles, but that's something we're looking at. Um, and we've been looking at from, in the digital team to try and get the organisation to put, to, to make that part of, I say, when I say part of the recruitment process, not necessarily 
uh, to do tasks, but certainly it's a consideration and it's a thing on the job description that is expected that and it's sort of moving beyond saying you've got Office skill, you know, Microsoft Office skills and you can do Excel and Word. It's, it's, that's very basic. Yeah. One-on-one, yeah. that's not... Yeah, sorry, I'm so, no, what I'm saying is, yeah, we're looking to move beyond that. I was sort of referring, that's historically what it's been like, but it's something we're, we're talking with our HR team at the moment about making that a, a core thing. Okay. Um, there, uh, there's a, a, a question about looking at what um, the sector should be focusing on the greatest opportunities in the next three to five years, in a brackets, in a perfect world. So what emerging trends do you think we should be onto for the next three to five years? Maybe you'd like to kick off with that, Duncan. Well, I think given the last comment, we've got to be a bit careful about jumping on like emerging trends when there's some like some foundational work to do to just build better services that incorporate digital products um, where appropriate. Um, so with that caveat, <laughs> um, I think there's some really interesting stuff happening around artificial intelligence, AI, AI, and how that can be used to provide um, very bespoke advice when people can build good data sets and well-segmented understandings of their audiences such that they can serve up very um, specific machine-generated um, information which feels very tailored to audiences. And I think um, it's a real buzzword, I know, but, but I think we're, we're experimenting with some of that with some um, tech products we're helping to build around how to provide um, curated support for particular audiences. And I think um, it'll be an interesting way for organisations to think about how they can um, change their models of delivery really. I think as a, as a sector we're very used to face-to-face, human-to-human contact and I'm not saying that isn't very important in lots of cases but there are opportunities to provide support digitally which change the, the cost profile of that, the access profile, the ability to reach mu many more people when it's not just about person-to-person -person advice, which is a very expensive way to deliver support and advice. So um, as we look to extend, use digital to extend reach, which I think is one of the big powers that it can give the sector, um, AI can be a really important, a really interesting part about how that can be a very powerful, you know, effective tool because of the difference in needs across segments of audiences you're trying to reach. Okay. Anything you'd like yeah, to... Yeah, just to pick up on that, I mean, that's, that's something we're very actively looking at so as a, as a charity one of the main things we do is provide information and advice but we provide it in different channels but we actually manage the content for that in completely different places so we've been thinking a lot about how we can um, have the knowledge managed in one place but serve it out through so you've got the website we've got local AGKs we've got the call center we've got a we've been using a virtual assistant for the last year or so um, and just learning from the virtual assistant it's essentially it's providing similar content we've got on the website but in a very different way but we're also starting to see you know, what people are typing in there. Um, at the moment, we're not doing it in a way that's using all the technology that we could to make it smarter. We found actually that that kind of technology, it's still quite, you still need quite a lot of resource around it, human resource around it to learn and understand. So this idea of this magic box that makes it all happen is hmm. maybe a little bit <laughs> along in the future. But, um, but yeah, we're thinking of that in the context of how do we use that intelligently so that if we're getting lots of questions in the chat box, how should we be changing some content somewhere else? Um, but also thinking about, you know, that currently uh, getting inbound phone calls and what are, in the same way that chat, what you've got the, um, what people are typing, but verbally what people are saying. Um, and there's a, obviously there's lots of tools now that you can use to do all those analytics now. Those are, you know, that's the sort of thing that you've got to go and get funding for. It's not cheap stuff, but, um, but yeah, we're looking at how, I suppose from our, it's, we're trying to make the, the business case in the organization of how, and try to explain that well enough to say that this is, we see this as both making it a better experience for people, but also it, it probably makes us more efficient because we're not, ma like I say, we're not managing. And we're also looking at voice uh, skills at the moment because for our, we believe with older people, the voice technology um, is, is, there's an obvious user case for mm. people who've got dexterity or mobility problems. Um, and again, that's just, that it's, it's content that could be driven from, from the same place. So I think that, it's a rambling way of saying, I think there's the artificial intelligence side of it, but it, the implementation for us is how we actually manage our content better. Okay. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, I, I don't disagree with either of what you've said. Um, I think that 
uh, maybe controversially, I don't think the charitable sector should be aiming for cutting edge or emerging edge tech. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got to get the plumbing right, we've got to get the basics right. We currently don't have what is normal for the everyday household in our charities. So uh, maybe the emerging trends in charity should be that. Like my three year old is using and interacting with voice technology in our house. You know, so, so, so things that are already commoditized, that we can buy in, that aren't cutting edge. Um, charities can be playing around with, and that includes things like chatbots. Mm. It, it's not emerging tech, really. It's just emerging in our sector. Mm. Um, I think um, the flip to that, though, with every opportunity, there comes a threat. And I think one of the things charity sector really needs to focus on are the threats that are coming from emerging technologies and AI, the biases that are in mm. many of these algorithms. Um, I'm not anti Data, uh, data science or anti-AI in any way, but uh, everybody has to be a little bit scared about face recognition technology, especially if you're working with vulnerable groups like we are in Bernardo's. Um, so I think that's probably going to be more of a focus than kind of the latest, shiniest thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I was listening to um, the chief exec of Cystic Fibrosis, um, who by his own admission was very anxious about, in the way that many senior leaders are, about particularly um, social media, uh, but having to actually wrap his head around it because the, um, the users and the, the members, i.e. people and people with cystic fibrosis, were already using social media. And the charity was then thinking, how do we control them? And then had to do this shift in the mindset, thinking, well, we can't control them. They're who we are serving. And also, so actually, the social, they've then changed their mindset and have liberated their, all of their members to be able to communicate with one another. Um, so the support group idea has really sort of blossomed much more because they don't have to control any of them. And they've also discovered that actually, and he didn't even know this, is that if you have cystic fibrosis, um, you really can't be in the, in the same room as another person with it because it's you're very, very infectious to one another. And so um, social media and video technology and so on has actually transformed how that communi community can actually connect with one another and, um, and not actually be reliant on sort of met the one to the many and the experts because they are the experts. So it's quite it's a different mindset. So to be thinking about that actually, I think, as trends in terms of... Um, how your communities can actually um, work in a differently engaged way with the organisation. This is an example, though, of, of ignoring the fact that we're talking about tech and starting with the users exactly. and their experience. Exactly. Um, so we've got loads of Slido things up there. So um, who is um, Charlotte and Zoe? OK, so would you like to say your question? Are you Charlotte? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> have you got the mic so that we can make sure that we hear what you have to say? Um, so I work for Tempo Time Credits and we work with disadvantaged communities. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at doing is introducing a digital currency. But we're worried that not all of the people that we work with have access to the digital world. So are there any tips with engaging with them in particular? OK. Who'd like to kick off with that? Do you know anything about this? How, how about, well, I'd probably say don't. If they're not in the digital world, don't use a digital <coughs> product. I think my advice would be, be user-led, understand what products, services are appropriate to, to where they are. And if it requires a significant amount of behaviour change or in, input of tech into their worlds, then that's a big, big barrier to them, to them actually using it, let alone the complexities of what a digital currency is for people. So. I would see that as a really big red warning flag about whether it's the right solution um, because there's some big barriers to overcome. Okay. That's interesting. Um, anything more to add to that? That sounds like a... a <laughs> Fairly definitive. I'm, I'd go and do user research and actually understand why they're not engaging with the digital world. If there, if there is something that is eminently solvable, then solve that first. They probably haven't got a phone. Um, also, the digital world isn't necessarily just the internet. Like you, they, they, you could, like, they're like oh, there are loads of different things that you can you can use um, to connect people to the digital world that aren't your standard interface. Um, so, so try and try and go in with an open mind when you're exploring 
how they're living and why they're living that way and kind of what their experiences is, experiences are and how they're connecting to the digital world. Um, but yeah, if, if, if it's not going to work for them, it's not going to work. <laughs> they just need five pound notes. Um, Zoe, where's Zoe? Yes, would you like to ask your question, which is about once you've got a strategy? Um, yeah, just um, one of the things I've heard all day is that um, digital culture change is really difficult um, and not really how to start it. So um, we've got past the problem of having a CEO who's bought in, they're bought in, so we've got leaders bought in, we've got our strategy written. It's literally the practical steps of where do we start, which I cannot find the answer for anyway. My idea was going to be digital champions. Um, you know, people in different teams that are enthusiastic about digital change. Um, is that where you would recommend? But you said there were some problems. Um, I guess just because it didn't work in the way we did, it doesn't mean say it can't work. I mean, I think, I think it's definitely something worth trying because I think it depends on the organisation, the size of the organisation, the buy-in from people. I think if, you know, if, if people are really up for that, um, then it can, I think it can work. I think the, I mean, the other thing I would say with that as well is trying to, trying to find something very easy to get a quick win on. I don't know if you've probably heard that this probably heard that before today, but I think having, doing something fairly quickly that can demonstrate that you can do something and you can get value quite quickly is also really important. So I guess not trying to have, um, it's great to be ambitious, but it's also great to have something that you can achieve quite quickly. Yeah, because I mean, you were talking earlier, Audrey, about finding a thing that would be galvanizing and exciting. Yes. Um, for the early, early adopters. So, so digital isn't, um, digital culture change is just culture change. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> um, and so, yes, it's as hard as culture change is. There are some fairly kind of well-established kind of routes to successful change and change leadership. Um, and so you're not likely to be able to introduce a thing. Um, it might galvanise people, might catalyse and get your foot, kind of your early adopters. But one thing's never really going to do it. So... Um, kind of think more broadly what are the what are the stories that you can tell people about how this is happening and why it's happening are people really connecting to the narrative around the change and why it's needed do they actually believe it have they been part of writing that story um is it aligned with your kind of central organizational strategy and actually are all of their when you get to performance appraisal time are people's kind of objectives aligned with it like, are, are you telling people to do one thing, but then judging them by a different kind of set of objectives? And so there's a question around making sure that you're aligned, that people have the skills and the knowledge they need, um, and they understand why they're, do, why they're doing it. And you've got the signalling from leadership at the top so that they can see what they need to do and why it's relevant to them and what the change, what, what the change in their behaviours needs to be. But that's, that's kind of a, a, quite a big kind of change management endeavour and change leadership endeavour. And you can pick off small things to, to tweak your way to it, but actually it's always going to be much broader. And one of the challenges that um, I've seen is that quite often people try and bring about a, a strategic culture change with the existing half an internal comms person. And this is a, this is a much bigger deal. Um, so if you're in that situation, definitely lobby for more support because the communications around um, change and change leadership is really important. Anything to add to that, Duncan? I, mean, I agree with all that. Uh, I think the only thing to add is um, people's ways of working and behaviours are ingrained. They are in all of us. And so expecting people who have worked in a certain way to suddenly work in a different way without a lot of support is, 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 is dangerous or difficult. I think, therefore, whether it be digital champions um, or not, some way of um, showing by doing with, with the right skill, some of those new skills embedded into teams. And so I, I think it's inevitable you need to think about bringing new people in, in a way which doesn't, isn't what I described at the beginning, which is on the side as a sort of seen as a threat, but embedded into um, the ways of working. We were just talking in the break around how Bernardo's did a bit of that around, around some of their strategic initiatives and brought service design thinking into the organisation and do that at the right level so that you can start to show what, because I, I, I don't like using the word digital. I think it's about just being you know, user-led, solving problems with the best tools, the best combination of tools in an integrated approach. And as soon as you bring it back around the aim, the thing that the organisation is trying to do and that, that department or that team are trying to do, and then go through a, a sensible process to unearth what, what the right things are, 
with someone in the team who understands what, and say, a service design process is, then the, the digital part of the answer will just will will emerge because it, it, it's it's inevitable that there will be parts of that which need to be digital. I think it's when it's foisted upon and feels like a threat and people don't understand or feel like you know it, that's when it when you know you can't you come up against resistance and and feel like you need a big change management program i think changing I've by doing read recently that somebody says i'm not going to talk about change management anymore because you can never manage it well <laughs> and the other thing is but you can lead it though cu cu the final thing to say on culture is it's not culture it is what it is you can't change culture it's culture is a reflection of an organization what you can do is try and like change the way you work you know try and think about what values you want to live but when people talk about culture change, it makes me laugh because you, culture is just is, is is what the organization is, and so people go in with culture change agendas, but but you just have to reflect, you just have to see what's what the organization wants to be, and so there's it's often such a gap between values or mission and culture and what the reality of an organization is, and people miss that often. Well, we've, we've we've written down what our culture is, why you know, but we're not behaving like that. Yeah. I was just about to say that is actually about behavior. And the thing about humans is that we actually hate change, but we're very adaptable. Um, and our brains like adaptation, even if we resist change. So actually, some of the, I was in the startup one, and, um, the, uh, and in my working life, you know, just do something, actually. Any first step will do, uh, because it's the one that you can. And then you're on the path. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's in the right order, or the, the, you know, the most strategic one, or whatever. But if you just do something, things will begin to change. Um, and the other question that um, I was asked is, what are we assuming here that's stopping us? And what else are we assuming? And what else are we assuming? And what else are we assuming that's stopping us? And are any of them true? Are they factually correct? Does the data stack up? And if they're true, we might have to change our strategy because they really are stopping us. But if they're not true, what could we credibly assume instead? And if we knew that, how would we? And sometimes people say, oh, if we knew that, I'd, on a Monday, I'd do this. You kind of go, hooray, let's, we're on the path. So anyway, right, well, it's a minute past five o'clock and we're gonna get in the way of a nice drink. So um, I would like to thank wholeheartedly on your behalf, and I hope that you will warmly clap them, uh, Duncan, Audrey and Paul, who've come to share their knowledge and wisdom with you this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed it.